All right, you guys excited to be in church today? Hey Amen. Wasn't worship just great this morning? I uh, so appreciate those intentional times that we have together as a church family just to hang out in the presence of God. It just, man, it just begins to change the atmosphere in the room and what's going on in our hearts just like that. And can we just express some love and appreciation for our worship team? These guys are a great... Humble men and women of God, and they, they put a lot of hours in, not only practicing their instrument, but learning new music, and oftentimes they'll serve at all five services on a weekend, and so make sure you let them know how much you love and appreciate them, and it's been a great service so far, but we're just getting started. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 19, looking at a message that I hope encourages you as much as it has me. We're in the, the third week of a series called Truth from the Tree. And what we're doing is we're looking at some of the last words that Jesus spoke before he died, phrases that he uttered while literally hanging on a cross. And shortly before that, if you remember, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says he was in such agony that literally drops of blood were coming from his brow as he thought ahead to what he would experience on the cross. And sure enough... It was worse than any of us could ever imagine. I mean, if you know anything about what would have happened, the Roman soldiers uh, beat him severely after whipping him 39 times across his back. They spat on him. They mocked him. They forced a crown of thorns over his head, and they took these stakes and drove them through his hands and his feet and suspended him midair on a criminal's cross. But when man was at his worst... God was at his best. In the midst of all that, after enduring all of the beating and all of the, all of the suffering, hanging on a cross, the first words that Jesus spoke was a prayer for the very people that were causing him pain, for the people that were spitting on him and mocking him, for the Roman soldiers who were driving those spikes through his hands and his feet. And he prayed, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. First week of our series, we... We looked at that in depth. Last week, we saw Jesus hanging on the cross, and for three hours in the middle of the day, literally darkness came over the whole land. And Jesus was in such a dark place and so much agony that he cried out, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And even though for us as believers, we'll never experience anything close to the degree of what Jesus went to on the cross, but... Still, there's times when life is hard and we find ourselves in seasons that are figuratively uh, dark, that we don't understand and we struggle and we find ourselves asking these questions, why? And last week, we looked at some just real practical truths, concrete things about the nature and character of God that we can hang on to and, uh, and not be moved and be confident in when the storms of life blow. This week, as we pick up the story in John 19, verse 28, says, later... Knowing that all was now completed, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And what they're going to do is they're going to give him vinegar to torture him. While he's thirsty on a cross, it was prophesied that this, was hap- that this would happen. And then in verse 30, when Jesus received the drink, he said the three most amazing words. He said, it is finished. Come on, let's say those words together. It is finished. Come on, everybody this time. Come on, it is finished. Come on, just imagine that moment when finally... The last prophecy was fulfilled. And Jesus, maybe in a triumphant cry, maybe in a gentle whisper, declared before God, it's done. Father, it's finished. I did what you sent me to do. And with that, Scripture says in verse 30 that he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now those words, it is finished, that phrase actually comes from one Greek word, to telestai. And if you're taking... Notes to telestai means to end, to complete, to execute, or to discharge a debt. And this one little word has so much rich meaning. I'll give you three ways that this word would have been used. Uh, one is when a servant 
returned to his master and said to Telestai, he's saying, Master, I finished the work. I've done everything that you asked of me. Secondly, uh, when a merchant said to Telestai, what he was saying is the debt has been paid in full. Nothing else is owed, totally paid for. Third, when a priest would examine a lamb for sacrifice, and the priest said to Telestai, he was saying that this lamb has no blemish at all. The sacrifice is acceptable. The sacrifice is perfect. And scripture tells us that Jesus was the perfect lamb of God who was slain for the sin of the world. That Jesus paid our sin debt and hanging on the cross, Jesus looked up at his father and said, I did it. It's finished. History has been changed. The prophecies have been fulfilled. Satan's plan has been thwarted. Sin has lost its sting and its power for those who are in Christ because Jesus finished the work. Come on, can we just celebrate that for a moment? Give the Lord some praise. Man, that ought to get you excited because Jesus finished the work. You can spend eternity in heaven. Because Jesus finished the work, your sins have been paid for. That's the good news of the gospel. The not so good news for some of us is that even though Jesus finished, you haven't. In fact, none of us have. If you're alive today, you've got some unfinished business. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. If there's blessing, breath in your lungs, there is more that God wants to do in you and more that God wants to do through you. And a key thought, if you're taking notes today, is that we all have unfinished business. Each and every one of us. You know, Scripture says that we were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. And as long as you're alive, God still has plans. Jeremiah 29, 11 says he has plans to prosper you, plans for your life, to bless you, to give you hope and a future. And I really believe that the Lord wants to speak to us today about completing some things that he's asked us to do. I believe that like he did, God wants us to finish well and finish strong by the power of his holy word. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus was talking to the church in Sardis and and here's what he said, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now Jesus is God, he sees all, he knows all, he knows everything we've ever done, every thought we've ever had, everything we've ever felt, everything we haven't done. He looks at these people and says, listen, I, I know your deeds, I see you, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. You know, maybe you have a reputation for having a good marriage, people on the outside call you a happily married couple. Uh, but deep down, you know that's not the case, that there's a lot of dysfunction and unhealthy stuff going on. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Maybe financially, people look at you and, you know, you got a nice car and you, you live in a nice house. And I think you've got it together, that you're financially stable and that you're generous. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that you're up to your eyeballs in debt and sinking more every day, maybe spiritually. People look at you at church and they see you in your Sunday best and think, man, that guy's really got it together with God. But you know on the inside, you're in a place where your relationship with God is somewhat flatlined and there's, there's not a lot of intimacy there. You're not spending time in his word. You're not spending time in his presence. You're not growing in him. Your actions don't line up with what you say you believe. Jesus says you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. And in verse 2, he says, wake up. Come on, everybody say, wake up. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. It says you still have some unfinished business. And the question I'd like you to answer today, and I can't answer it for you, what's your unfinished business? And honestly, for you, it may not be a huge area of hypocrisy like he was calling out in Revelation 3. Maybe it's something that God's given you a burden for. Man, it meant to do and you haven't yet. Maybe it's something you know that God has created you to do. Maybe God's called you to adopt or to be a foster parent. Or maybe your unfinished business is to forgive somebody or to get out of debt 
or to be generous or maybe you're un finished business is to share the love of Christ with somebody that you know God's placed on your heart that they don't know him and they need to know him. I don't know what it is for you, but I want to encourage you to let the Lord speak to your heart today because every single day that God blesses us with is another opportunity to take one step closer to the purpose that he has for us. And Jesus, who's our example, finished well. I mean, there's no doubt about it. As you look at his life, his ministry, even what he fulfilled on the cross, Jesus finished well. But let's, let's just be honest. Let's be real for a moment. We live in a culture where, pe- where people start many things and only finish few, right? I mean, maybe you can relate. I know I can. I'm guilty of that myself. And so how do we, how do we like Christ, finish well? And I want to give you a couple simple thoughts about it today. If you're taking notes, these aren't complicated, uh, but they work, okay? So number one, make a commitment. If you want to finish strong, we're going to make a commitment. And before I unpack this, I just want to call something out because I think we have a skewed view of what commitment really looks like. It's easy for us to say, yeah, we've, we've done that. But how many know there's a difference between starting something and finishing something? Not the same thing. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 11. He says, now finish the work so that your eager willingness, and if you got your Bibles out, you're taking notes, go ahead and circle those words, eager willingness. Finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your what? Completion. Go ahead and underline that word, completion. Finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. See, I believe in our culture that commitment is often defined by just mere eager willingness. And it ends there. But that isn't commitment. It isn't commitment until you start completing what your eager willingness was all about. Your commitment is taking your passionate desire to do something, drawing a line in the sand and say, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm not turning back. You know, I read this week about a Spanish conquistador in the 1500s that set out to discover a new world. He took 11 ships and 700 man, men. And when they got there, there was natives there. And they didn't get a warm welcome. And the men got tired. And they were being killed. And they were hungry. And there was some dissent going on. And so when the leader of these men heard about it, this dissent and this desire to go back, you know what he did? He burned the boats. That's right. He burnt the ships. He says, we're moving forward. We're, we're going to complete what we started and what we set out to do. Kind of reminds me of, you know, in the Old Testament when this great prophet Elijah showed up to Elisha and called him to come follow him, to be his disciple, to become a prophet, a man of God. And, and Elisha was wealthy, had all this field and this land. He was out actually when, he showed, when the prophet showed up to him, he was, he was plowing along with his oxen. And scripture says that when he said yes to the call of God, he actually took the plows that he was using, burnt the plows to cook the livestock that he was pulling them with. He said, I'm burning plan B. Okay, I'm, I'm not coming back to being a farmer. I'm, God's called me to be a prophet. I'm going to finish that work. I know that for us, when the Lord was stirring in our hearts about planting this church, uh, that, that when we take, took a step of faith and says, okay, we're going to do it, man, we'd, we'd made a pretty big commitment in our hearts to a finishing decision. You know, I remember at the time when we were, we were in that place reading a statistic that was staggering about how many church planters never actually have a service. That they set out, that they say, God wants us to start a church over here, start a new work, and they never do because it's, there's challenges that they didn't expect, and it's a little bit harder, and, you know, even churches that do start, very often they don't make it through the first year or two, or if the church hangs on, the pastor leaves, and, and I just, I just had this burden, Ashley and I did, said, hey, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we need to be all in, and so we sold, or we put our house on the market, We left our family and friends, and we left our ministry positions of where we were, and we came out here, and we didn't know what to expect. There's no guarantees in church planning other than it's going to be difficult. That's about the only guarantee I had. We didn't know if we were going to have 30 people or 300 or 3,000, but we said we're all in on this, and we, so one of the things we did is we actually bought a house in Clinton before we'd even had a service, before we had a church. That was our way of saying, hey, we're, we're burning plan B. We're, we're in. We're not looking back. This is where God has called us to be, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was battling over what he knew would happen, over what he would have to go through and endure, he prayed. He said, Father, if you're willing... 
take this cup from me, like if there's any other way. But then something changed. There was a shift, and I believe it's a moment where Jesus stepped across the line, and there was no turning back. He said, yet not my will, but your will be done. And man, Jesus was committed. If we're going to finish strong like Jesus, we need to make a commitment. Not just eager willingness, but we need to commit to a finishing decision. And secondly, we need to take the next step. If you're taking notes, we make a commitment and we take the next step. And after that, we're going to take the next step. And then we're going to take the next step after that. And after that, we're going to take another step. Why? Because it's impossible to finish a race if you're not moving. Right? I mean, I don't care if you're the tortoise or the hare. If you're not taking steps towards the finish line, you will never reach it. But the problem for many of us is that the distance between where we're at now and where God wants us to be is overwhelming. I mean, when there's a lot of road left between us and the finish line, it can be paralyzing. And I believe that's why a lot of people don't finish. They look at this huge chasm that separates where they are from the fulfillment of their project or their dream or their vision or their journey or whatever. They look at this huge chasm and they say, man, I just can't do this. And I'm here to tell you today that with God's help, you can. You've just got to keep taking the next step and taking the next step. See, we're all in different places on our journey with the Lord. You know, you and I, were not in the same place. My next step is probably different than your next step, but how many know that's okay, Right? It is, and so some of you, you're, you're here, maybe you recently got saved, but you haven't told anybody about it. You've never, you haven't told anybody what, what God's done in your life, and that's the next step for you. Maybe the next step is to, to let us know so we can come alongside you. Maybe the next step for you, take this seriously, is to sign up and get baptized in a few weeks. To be obedient in that first step of obedience as a Christian. Others of you, you've been coming You've been, you've been enjoying the church, you, you love what's going on, you know that you want to be more a part of what God's doing here, that God's given you a burden and he's given you abilities that he wants to be used by him. And so the next step for you may be to sign up for growth track, to go through growth. In fact, I just say that if you're a member of this church, if you've been attending, then that is your next step. So I would encourage you to do that. It runs the first, second, third, and fourth weekend of every month during one of our service. You can still attend church and stick around for one of the services and attend Grow Track back in the youth room. You know, maybe for you, the next step is for you to get involved in a life group with other believers who are also taking their next steps to follow Jesus. Because so much of what God wants to do in our lives happens in community with one another. I'm telling you, the people that you choose to surround yourself with are going to have a significant impact on your future. Some of you, you need to start a Bible reading plan. Maybe you've gotten saved and you've been coming to church and you love the messages and it fills you up, but, but you don't know that much about the Bible and it just seems intimidating to try and read it on your own. Like, where do I start and what do I do? And really, you just need to start. And there's so many Bible reading plans out there today. Great devotionals that help you walk you through that. In fact, if you haven't downloaded the YouVersion Bible app, you know, I'll give you permission to get your phone out right now and download it, okay? It's the only time I'm going to do that. But, uh, you know, download that. And there's a bunch of resources, free Bible plans. You can search topics, Bible in a year, whatever. Five minutes a day. And maybe the next step for you is today, before you go to bed, to spend five minutes reading your Bible. And you're not going to know everything about the Bible in five minutes, but then tomorrow you'll take the next step and spend more five, min- five more minutes. And then the next day, five minutes after that. You know, I, I don't know what it is for you, but wherever you're at, with one step of faith after another, with one step of obedience after another, you can finish the race that God has marked out for you. And here's the deal. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. And some of you need to hear that today, that that uncertainty has been holding you back. You don't have to know every detail. You don't have to understand how it's all going to work out before you take the next step. Because how many know God is good? Amen? God is good, and here's the deal. He does know. He knows exactly how it's all going to work out, and he's got you. He's for you. If he's calling you to take a step, you can trust him. David in Psalm 119 said, Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet. 
Your word is a light for my path. It teaches me how to live. It teaches me where to step. But so often we want God to illuminate every turn and every little speed bump and every obstacle. We want like the next five years all mapped out exactly what's going to happen. Now, I'll just be honest, God doesn't usually do that. But scripture does say that our steps are ordered by the Lord. That he's leading us, that he's guiding us. His word is a lamp to our feet, a light unto our path. Jesus said, if anyone follows me, he will never walk in darkness. We can hang on to that. And so my encouragement for you today is to trust God and take the next step. Listen, you don't have to map out the whole thing. But what's your next step? Again, this is about you getting specific today. What, what's your next step? It, it doesn't have to be complicated. Maybe it's a small step like writing the letter or cutting up the credit cards or filling out an application or writing the tithe check or forgiving someone. Or maybe your next step is going to happen today when you commit your life to Christ, when you surrender your life to Him for the very first time. But if we're going to finish strong, man, we've got to commit with great resolve and take the next step. Yeah, I was thinking about this week just the life of Christ and all of the steps that he would have taken to fulfill his purpose. I mean, you go back just during his childhood and his adult life into his earthly ministry, Jesus was living on mission all the time and and then you know just during Easter season just think about not only the trial and even fast forward to after the beating time but you know the the garden of Gethsemane to the cross Jesus was crucified on a hill and I think for me this week just thinking about this thought of taking the next step that kind of had a richer meaning for me he was crucified on a hill called Golgotha and it literally meant the place of the skull I've often wondered what that journey must have been like for Jesus. If you remember by this point, he was beaten within an inch of his life, barely recognizable as a man, yet he kept moving forward. Step after step after step, uphill to carry our sin to the cross. He was in agony. He had a crown of thorns pierced his skin, shoved down over his over his head, yet he took a step with hope that you would say yes to a relationship with him. That you wouldn't perish, but you'd spend eternity with him in heaven. And then he picked up a beam that he would eventually be hung on. He placed it on his beaten shoulder, and he took a step with hopes that, were, that those who are under the weight of addiction and bondage would be set free. That those who found themselves at rock bottom could be lifted up out of the pit. And he took another step so that our lives could be redeemed. That we wouldn't have to stay where we were. That we could be adopted into the family of God. And then he clawed his way to the place where nails the size of railroad spikes would pierce his body. And he hung on the cross not because he deserved it but because he loves us. And after hours hanging on the cross. Finally, he looked up to heaven and he said to Telestai, it's finished. I did it. And he gave up his spirit. And for those of us who still have breath in our lungs, for those who have, of us who have not yet finished what God has purposed us to finish, I want to encourage you with what Philippians 1, 6 says says that we can be confident of this. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Okay, I just want you to think about that, that, that the God who began this good work in you, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In 1968, in the Mexico City Olympics, John Stephen Aquari from Tanzania set out for hopes of an Olympic gold medal in the 26.2 mile marathon. Now, I say point two because I'm married to a marathoner, and let me just tell you, the point two matters, okay? It's not a 26 mile, it's point two. And uh, sadly, about halfway through the race, John was injured, he fell, cut up his leg. Actually, he dislocated his knee uh, from the joint. The other runners ran on and... 
about an hour after everybody else had finished, John shocked the people in the stadium when he came hobbling, hobbling in with his leg all wrapped up. And afterwards, you know, the reporters asked him, like, why did you do that? Why did you keep running when the race was over? And he said, my race wasn't over. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish it. And God hasn't called us to simply start a race. God has called us to finish it. So often our, our life here is likened to a race that we're running, that there's, that there's a prize at the end of it. And so I want to encourage you today to, to simply make a commitment, take the next step, and finish strong. Hebrews 12 says, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. And maybe for you, that is your next step. The next step for you is to throw off those things that are hindering you, something that's holding you back, something you, you've been hanging on to that's keeping you from finishing what God has called you to do. To, to get rid of that so you can run freely and lightly. Let's, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray together. Jesus, right now in this moment, we do. We fix our eyes on you. And Lord, before I say anything else, I just want to say thank you for finishing the work. God, thank you that when men came against you and you were falsely accused, and they said all kinds of evil against you and they spat on you and they mocked you. And it was, I can't even imagine how hard that in those moments you didn't give up. You didn't quit. Your eager willingness to seek and to save that which was lost was matched by your completion of your task. Thank you for dying in my place so that I could live. And as we fix our eyes on you, Jesus, you are indeed the author of our faith. You are the perfecter of our faith. And you have given us the perfect example to follow. And God, I pray this for myself and I pray this for every believer in this room. Lord, would you help us to be more like you? God, to finish the work that you set out for us to finish. To do the things that you created us to do. In Acts 20, in verse 23, the Apostle Paul said something it's just really powerful for me. He said, I know that in every city, prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race. My only aim is to complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. Oh, that that would be our hearts, that we could say that with integrity, that my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. For him, Paul's task was obvious. It was testifying to the gospel of grace. It was telling the world about Jesus. We know that Every one of us as believers have been also called to that task. That we share that responsibility, that we've all been commissioned by God. But I, I do want you to get specific today. Before we close, I want you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed to, if you can't answer this question now, at least write it down and wrestle with the question this week. 
What's my unfinished business? What has God called me to finish, to complete? And I don't know what that is for you, but I'm believing that if you are willing to ask the Lord and wrestle with that question, that God is, he's a speaking God. He loves to speak to his people. He'll prompt you. He'll he'll guide you. And and when he does and you find clarity, what do you do from there? You make a commitment. And when you hear God's voice, obey immediately. Make a commitment and then take the next step. And then take the next step after that and take the next step after that. And one day you'll stand before the Lord and you'll be able to say, to tell us die. God, I did what you called me to do. And he will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. And Lord, that we would all live our lives in a way to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servants. God, help us to make the most of every opportunity that you have entrusted us with. Every resource that you've entrusted us with. All that we have and all that we are. God, teach us to finish the work. As you're praying, I want to clarify something. When I talk about unfinished business, I'm not talking about your salvation. Just to be clear, the reality is your salvation is already paid for. Jesus finished the work of your salvation. That's not something that you have to earn. That's not something you have to be good enough to deserve. Jesus paid it all on the cross. The telestai, he did it. If you want eternal life, if you want forgiveness of sins, if you want salvation... Man, you've just got to receive the gift of His grace. You confess Him as your personal Lord and Savior. Those of you that are believers, man, you can be confident that your salvation is secure, that your eternity is paid for, not because you're awesome, but because He's awesome, and He paid for it for you. So walk in that confidence. But some of you are here, and the reality is that that you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you know about Him, and you know things about God, but you don't really know Him. In a personal way, listen, he's a personal God and he wants to know you. There's a big difference between having information about God and having a relationship with God. And and so for you, you're sensing right now in this moment, the next step for you is to give your life to him. To make him the Lord of your life. And maybe you're sitting here and you're not really a church person. You don't know that much about the Bible and what's going on, but there's something stern inside of you. You're recognizing that that you're a sinner and you need a savior you're you're recognizing your need for Jesus but maybe in the back of your mind you're you're thinking I just don't understand enough and I need to learn more listen you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately what you need to understand is that God loves you God has good things in store for you he wants to have a relationship with you and the next step I'd encourage you don't wait take that step today make him the Lord of your life and then he'll clean you up and he'll make you new and he'll wash your sins away and he'll fill you with purpose and desires and man he will give you under Understanding as you continually take one step of faith after the another. And so I want to give you the opportunity to take that step today, to make that commitment to follow Jesus. It's the most important step that you could ever take. Jesus came, endured the cross, suffered, died, and rose from the grave so that you could be saved. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, Nobody looking around, if that's you. You say, Pastor, today I'm, I'm making a commitment. I'm going to follow Jesus. I need him in my life. I need him to make me new, to forgive me. I'm going to live for him. If that's you, would you just boldly slip up your hands all across this room right now? Yes, 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 yes. Great, awesome. Yeah, praise the Lord for you guys. Hands all across the room. You can put your hands down, and I just want to say how proud I am of you, how excited I am for you, and I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm going to invite everybody 
in the auditorium to pray this prayer with me if you would out loud pray Heavenly Father thank you for loving me I believe you died for me so I could live for you forgive me of my sins make me new and help me to live for you to fulfill my purpose today I'm making a commitment to follow Jesus Jesus be my Savior and the Lord of my life Amen